Time for our first side battle. As I went over the army prep last video, let's get right to the fight. The Union is aggressively attempting to secure areas in Virginia. Their armies are occupying several towns before the local militia could take up arms against them. The rebellion needs your assistance to defend a small town near Newport News. The Federals are approaching from multiple directions with superior forces. You must lead a portion of your troops and the local militia to repel the intruders. One Corps, three brigades. Sir, it was very brave of you to refuse Lincoln's call to arms and join the Confederacy's cause. The Union is trying desperately to convince the locals not to secede and is attempting an investment of Virginia with military forces. Numerous Union infantry is approaching our town from three directions. Northwest. North. And Northeast. It is vital to protect the town and show the Yankees that we are not going to leave our lands undefended. The incoming Union forces are too strong. We cannot stop them, only delay them. So it is advised to deploy skirmishers and advance north of the town to buy time for our reinforcements. Our cavalry scouts have returned from their reconnaissance mission and will assist your efforts. The Virginia local militia has been called up. We will receive infantry and artillery to counterattack. Until then, hold your ground, General. At the start of the map, the only enemy force will be at the top center, composed of two infantry brigades, a cannon battery, and a skirmisher. At 27 minutes on the timer, the first enemy reinforcement group shows up, consisting of two more infantry brigades, a cannon battery, and a somewhat sizable melee cavalry brigade. The cavalry is going to be this stage's wild card. It might sweep your cannons, it might block your own cavalry from getting to the enemy cannons, it might not show its face at all, or it might even try to rush one of your infantry brigades and get mowed over. As long as it is alive, however, always keep an eye on the minimap. Having it find your smaller cavalry while they are behind enemy lines is a good way to lose the unit, and any hope of depriving the Union of its artillery. And lastly, a force will show up here with precisely two minutes left on the clock. It will have another two infantry brigades, one cannon, another skirmisher, and the general, and will be followed shortly by a supply wagon. It should make it to your town before your own reinforcements do, but be aware they are coming, as I have more than once taken unnecessary hits on my cavalry by trying to have them hide here. As for your own forces, you get a 250 sized skirmish cavalry that starts the map here, a large reinforcement group consisting of two five cannon batteries, four infantry brigades, and a general will spawn here once the first timer expires. and you will get another 250 sized skirmish cavalry midway through the second phase, with an ammunition wagon coming in shortly thereafter in this corner. During the first phase, we just want to delay the opponents to make time until our reinforcements get here. To that end, I will set up with one infantry brigade over here, one in the town, and the cannon battery being just outside of the town to the left. It's tempting to split off a skirmish group to hide in this wheat field, but the enemy AI tends to overreact to them if you do so, resulting in the entire Northwest force coming around this way, which is less than ideal. While this setup seems like I'm making the artillery an inviting target, let me describe the early game plan. Last stage, I demonstrated using defensive fortifications. This time, I'll demonstrate not using them. Not yet, at least. The town has locations you can occupy, which give these bonuses, but there are two reasons you may not want to. First is that, when a normal infantry unit occupies a fortification, it stops volley firing and instead takes up a pseudo fire at will style. It fires a bit faster than normal, but less damage per shot. It's not as bad as the firing at will of a panicked unit, but it's still an overall damage loss. Second is that town terrain is tied for the highest defensive potential of anything in the game. 
If I were to take the defensive spot, I would get a cover bonus exactly as stated in the box here, but if I just park my men in the town normally, they'll actually enjoy a 100% cover bonus, which more than makes up for the additional projectile resistance bonus they'd be getting as well. And there is another mechanics related reason for this setup, collateral damage. Every unit in this game has a size, which is represented by its graphical interface. This brigade's size is this, and that is used for determining what terrain they're standing in, who can reach them to shoot at them, who they can reach with their own weapons, etc. However, should anyone actually shoot at them, then another size comes into play, which is larger than the units and looks like this. Technically, it's determined by what type of weapon is being fired at your guys, but this size buffer is a good approximation to figure it as. This is the collateral damage range. Any unit, friend or foe, that has any part of its own size inside of this bubble, while the target is being shot at, will get damaged as well. While usually this is just something to keep in mind, as in most cases the collateral damage function is only 5% of the firing unit's damage potential, when it comes to all fortified positions in general, and this defensive position specifically, it causes the brigade occupying it to have a unit size of this and a colander da uh, collateral damage range of roughly this. And while we do want the cannons to be as close to the fight as possible to provide support fire, if we take the town occupation position, those cannons are going to be taking hits all the way back to here every single time any enemy fires at the brigade in front of it, including the enemy artillery bombardments. But I'm advocating to not take the position, so why have the cannons over here? The answer is these two bonuses. Should the enemy decide to charge into melee, then occupying the position will go from being meh to being an insane bonus, allowing our single brigade to hold up well against two equal size enemies. But that will only be safe for our cannons if they are outside of the bubble to begin with. But that's not the only reason to hold the cannons off to the side. With one infantry brigade holding the town, and the other back here, the only direct route to the cannons for the Union is this way, and even if they head into the town, rather than go for the cannon bait, they will, in either case, have the majority of their four northern infantry brigades approaching across the river here. Which is what we want, as it allows this brigade to capitalize on it. If positioned properly, the enemy force will reach engagement range of the town defending infantry right as they get stuck in the defenseless river, then this brigade can sweep like this and plant even more fire into them. Worst case is that some of the northwest infantry comes down this way, but if that happens, the left infantry can slide into the wheat field here to engage them, covering our cannons from a sweep. In either case, our defensive position should allow us to trade very favorably with the enemy, so long as all four enemy infantry brigades don't show up at the same time, which usually results in the AI realizing its numerical advantage and activating a charge. So how can we prevent all four from arriving simultaneously before we get our own reinforcements? The answer is in this cavalry. The AI reacts to any information it has. At the stage's exact onset, it doesn't realize this unit is here, as no Union troops can see it. But within a few seconds, the enemy will make contact, assuming you haven't started the map by pausing it and ordering the cavalry array to the northeast. My preferred plan is to have the cavalry spot the enemy here, with the intention being that they remain spotted for a bit. While exact enemy reaction may vary, it's almost guaranteed that you'll be able to divert some of the enemy's forces. Cannons may unlimber to take a shot at you, infantry may change course to give chase, or if you are really lucky, you can get your guys into the enemy's cannons early. If done well, you can keep ahead of any enemy infantry and have just enough of a buffer distance so that, when you get out of the back side of the forest, you can then mount up and run southwards, having successfully changed the first group's orders from just being charge the town lol. Basic military doctrine. Divide and conquer.
I mean, if they're just gonna let me have their cannons, I'm not gonna say no. Odd. Usually they have someone turn around to fight off my calf before I can get the whole battery. Since I've lost sight of the skirmishers, let me split my own group off to stop them from making a big surprise flank. Oops, never mind, here they come. Almost as fast as my horses, it seems. who will sit down in this forest and dismount so that they can interfere with the... Duh, never mind. So that they can mount back up and start running around to keep this infantry occupied. While I'm waiting for the main action to begin, let me explain why I made my three brigades the size I did. It has to do with the game's dynamic difficulty as well as our reinforcements. Specifically, the bigger I make my three guys, the bigger all of the enemy forces will be. However, our own side's reinforcement sizes wouldn't change. The cavalry will always be about 250, the infantry about 600 each, and the two batteries at five cannons each, no matter what I did. Which means that, for this stage at least, the bigger I make my brigades, the more outnumbered we would have ended up being. As for why I chose 700, it's because that is around where the game's minimum scaling takes place. Any smaller than that, and the enemy brigades would still keep the size you'll see them at in this video. I mean, I guess I could have fine-tuned it farther to like 697, but I like my round numbers. Hmm, they seem to be going heavy on the left. Guess I'm gonna have to back up. I sure don't want to be the guy in the water when the bullets start flying.
You did your best, General, to hold the Yankees. Our reinforcements arrived to teach them a lesson. Cavalry and supplies are on their way. With a large amount of units now here, I'm going to pause the action while I give them their orders. The cannons I will move with the already placed battery, though I want the new arrivals closer to the enemy. The infantry will take up positions on the north and east edges of the town, and will be given the sprint command to get them there quickly. And the new general can generalize from here. Just like last stage, the AI got a bit charge happy and appeared to have petered out right before they caught my own forces which isn't going to end well for them, as they are out in the open field, I'm in the town, and these two units are about to give them the good news from the side, along with some raking cannon fire. And so, the main strategy for the stage. Less than half the forces on the map right now are actually mine. Not only do any casualties to them not count against my own army, but any losses they take, I have a chance to recover fallen weapons from. So it behooves me to let them take the brunt of the fighting. Indeed, since, assuming you win the stage of course, the player actually benefits from his allies taking damage, it's even a fair idea to charge them into melee and then have your own units go all long shanks into the scuffle. I have to make sure I'm actually going to win before I milk the results though, so staying in town and exchanging fire with the in-river opponents is still the immediate action. But with the taking fire role now occupied by the Virginia militia, I am free to take my own two infantry brigades and start swinging them around west for a rather brutal flanking maneuver. Oh, hey, there's the enemy cavalry, running straight at my cannons. In theory, I could have let the enemy cavalry reach my ally cannons so that I have a chance to rescue some of them from my own army, but as there is no other defense between them and my own personal artillery, I'd rather chase the horses off. Once all of the opposing infantry is engaged with your forces at the town, their batteries will, 99% of the time, take up positions here. If you still have your cavalry from the stage's start, and you know where the enemy melee cavalry is, then this is exactly the time to have your horse dudes charge slaughter some smoothbores. 
If you don't know where the enemy cavalry is, then your skirmish cavalry can consider pulling in behind one of the infantry brigades engaging the town and fire into them from behind. That way, if the enemy cavalry show up, you can run from them easier since you won't be engaged in melee. I want to take my main infantry around for some flanking fun, but I lost sight of the enemy cavalry, so I'll detach a skirm here to cover the south end of my cannons should they try to make another run on them. And they're going for my supplies instead. The AI in this game really likes trying to steal supply wagons. Like many things AI related, this can sometimes end up biting them in the horse's haunches, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And here's an example of the AI going all ham on the ham. One of their infantry brigades tried to disengage from the fight to run down my reinforcement supplies, but they aren't going to reach them in time. Once it passes the river and is back on open fields, the supply wagon will actually be faster than the infantry will. I mean, not that I recommend this maneuver in general, but as long as one can take advantage of it, one may as well. With multiple enemy infantry having been shattered from the combination of flanking attack and close-range cannon barrage, and the remaining enemies all now engaged against the four reinforcement brigades, it's time to go on the aggressive. The win is basically guaranteed, time for the spoils. In real life, I'd feel bad about doing this to my own troops, but video games have a long and storied history of killing everyone that isn't you and taking their stuff starting by having my skirmish cav rush a unit twice their size at the town's north end.
and for one final amusement, the enemy cavalry has run the entire length of the map to capture that one rogue supply wagon. Granted, normally, losing a supply wagon is horrible, but the thing is, this isn't my supply wagon. So, whatever dude, glad you left my cannons alone. And there we have it. Not only was this a victory with a 5 to 1 casualty ratio, but most of them weren't even my troops. Results this good are rare in this game, so I'm going to savor it. Okay, that's long enough. Rescued 10,000 supplies. Hey Panda, do I get paid if an enemy steals an allied supply wagon? So, in only my third video of the series, I'm already going to change what I said I was going to do. After a few trial runs, I've decided it's better to do the army restructuring at the beginning of a video before the battle rather than after it. So the rebuild for the next fight will be at the start of next video. Until then.